This guide is for beginners or for people that would like a refresher on how to build a computer. For those of you that already know how to build a computer, you may learn something from this guide. And for the absolute beginner, after watching this video, you should be able to build one on your own. If I had to compare it to something, your processor is like the heart of your computer. So with that in mind, the first thing you need to know is which processor are you going to buy? In order to find that out, the first thing you need to ask yourself is what do I need this computer to do? If you're just gonna search the internet, watch videos and play games that aren't very demanding like League of Legends, Overwatch or basically any other esports title, then you can settle for a lower end CPU like a Ryzen 3 1200 or an Intel i3. Now what I just said might confuse you, so here is a quick explanation. Those processors I just mentioned have a lower core count than most processors and have a low to medium range clock speed. Inside a processor, the more cores and threads you have, the stronger it will be and the more it will be able to handle. The clock speed of a processor kind of follows that same principle in that the higher the clock speed is, the stronger it will perform. Some programs and tasks are more demanding than others. For example, League of Legends could be run on a single core processor, while advanced 4K video rendering and special effects would need eight cores with a high clock speed to perform at the expectation. If you want the best processor for you, look up the game or programs that you plan on running with the phrase recommended requirements afterwards and there should be plenty of articles or videos telling you which processor you should get. As the name implies, this part is to keep your processor cool. A processor gets very hot while performing tasks and needs help staying cool in order to keep doing so. Without a cooler, your processor would fry. Now most processors have an automatic shutdown feature when they get too hot, but either way, you never want your processor to get there. There are two main ways to cool your processor, which are air cooling and liquid cooling. Both have their benefits, but for a beginner, I would recommend air cooling since it's a little bit easier to install. Now some manufacturers sell CPU coolers with their processors, like AMD with their Ryzen chips. Most of the time these processors are sufficient, but if you plan on doing something like long-term gaming or extreme content creation, then I highly recommend getting a beefier cooler. Now your motherboard is the main hub for your computer because this is where all the parts will get connected so that they can work together. There are many different motherboards to choose from, but after selecting your processor, there will only be a few specific models that you can use. The way you should think about this is as follows. Each processor belongs to a specific generation. Intel has processors that belong to a second generation, third generation, fourth generation, all the way up to the current ninth generation. Each generation has its own name, which you can easily Google if you would like to know them. As for AMD, they have Summit Ridge, Raven Ridge, and Pinnacle Ridge, or as they are more commonly called Ryzen processors. The reason you need to know that is because there are motherboards that are built specifically to support one and sometimes up to two generations of processors. But not only do certain motherboards support specific generations, they also support specific socket types. Each processor has its own specific socket type that you need to know so that you can choose the correct motherboard. So when selecting your motherboard, you need to know two things. Does it support my processor's generation and does it support my processor socket type as well? There should be a few options for you to pick from once you find motherboards that fit those two qualifications. And by the way, some will be more expensive than others. From my experience, the cheaper ones will be plain looking and sometimes have issues. And the more expensive ones will have a lot more features and look a lot nicer. If I were you, I would just get something in the middle. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. The more you have, the more internet tabs and programs you can have running at once without experiencing lag. Some programs require more RAM in order to run smoothly. To make this simple, if you plan on streaming while gaming or doing content creation, get 16 gigabytes of RAM. If you're just gonna game, search the internet and watch videos, then get eight gigabytes of RAM. You can get less or more than that if you want, but since this is a beginner's guide, that's my recommendation for you. Also, small side note, if you're buying an Intel processor, the frequency of your RAM really does not matter all that much. But if you're getting a Ryzen processor, try to get higher frequency RAM if you can afford it. It will help with your performance, not necessarily enough for a beginner to notice, but it will definitely help. It will help with your performance, maybe not enough for a beginner to notice, but it is definitely worth it. One last thing about RAM, there are actually different types of RAM. If you wanna know which kind of RAM you need, if you check the specifications of the processor you buy, it should tell you there. For the most part though, if you're buying a processor that was made in late 2015 onwards, you'll most likely need DDR4. And if you bought a processor that was made in 2015 to as early as 2007, then you will need DDR3 RAM. I'm not gonna give you any suggestions for processors earlier than 2007 because you should not be building a computer with hardware older than that unless you have a YouTube channel and you're just trying to do something crazy. 
So inside a graphics card is a graphics processing unit, AKA a GPU. Now there are a lot of different ways to think about which option would be the best one for you. However, I'm going to teach you the most straightforward approach so that you can choose the best card for you regardless of what brand you go with. There are three main specifications for graphics cards that let you know how good they are. The clock speed, the amount of VRAM, and the memory bus width. The analogy I like to use to explain these specs is a street. Basically, the busier the street, the better the card is. Think of the clock speed like a speed limit. The higher it is, the faster the cars can travel down the street. Think of the amount of VRAM like how many cars go down the street per cycle. And then think of the memory bus width as how many lanes there are on that street. The cars are supposed to represent data and basically the more cars you have moving and the faster they can travel, the better performance you will get out of your graphics card. However, if you can't understand that analogy, here is my recommendation to you. Do not ever get anything lower than 1000 megahertz clock speed, two gigabytes of GDDR5 RAM and 128 bit memory bus width. It's not that specs lower than that are unplayable, but they will definitely be less enjoyable. This one is pretty easy to understand. You need a power supply so that all your parts can have the power to run. Parts like your processor and graphics card will have a recommended wattage when you look at their specifications. If you add up that recommended wattage and buy a power supply with that much wattage, you should have more than enough power to run your computer successfully. For the most part though, what I have come to learn is that if you use power supplies that come with a little less wattage than what they recommend in the specifications for your parts, you'll usually be fine. I'm not saying you should do this, but I've been able to run computers where the recommended wattage was 650 watts on a 450 watt power supply. The other specification you need to look out for when buying a power supply is the rating. From lowest to highest, they are as follows. Non-rated, 80 plus, 80 plus bronze, 80 plus silver, 80 plus gold, 80 plus platinum, and 80 plus titanium. The higher rating you have, the more power efficient your power supply will be. In detail, this means that your power consumption will more accurately reflect what your computer needs depending on what tasks it's being asked to run. Also, my warning to beginners is that out of all the parts to try and save money on, don't let one of them be your power supply. Cheap power supplies are more likely to have issues and the worst case scenario is that if your power supply goes bad or fries, it has the potential to fry all the other components in the computer with it. That doesn't mean get an 80 plus titanium rated power supply, but if you do get something 80 plus bronze rated, you should be fine. Also, there are different sized power supplies, but unless you're getting a mini ITX motherboard, just get the regular sized ATX power supply. Now notice I wrote drive, not hard drive. In this day and age, what you want your computer's operating system to work off of is a solid state drive. Long story short, this will make the turning on and off and the load times of your computer significantly faster. Now, if you like storing a lot of photos, videos, or other files, then yeah, you can get a hard drive for additional storage, but if you don't, just buy a solid state drive. And in case I didn't just make this clear, you can have multiple drives inside your computer. This is the glue you will be using to keep your CPU cooler on your processor. The reason we specifically use thermal paste is because its compounds make it better for heat transfer. The other reason we use it is because on a microscopic level, the lid of your CPU and the base of the CPU cooler have cracks that the human eye cannot see. What the thermal paste does is it helps fill up those cracks for a more clean heat transfer from the CPU to the CPU cooler. Now, before you pick the prettiest case you can find, you need to make sure that your case will fit the motherboard you selected as well as all the other components. Now, unless you're getting a giant graphics card or CPU cooler, you pretty much don't have to check the specifications for either of those. If you got an EATX or ATX sized motherboard, then you will need an ATX sized case. If you got a micro ATX sized motherboard, then you will need a micro ATX sized case. And finally, if you got a mini ITX sized motherboard, you will need a mini ITX sized case. Now, most ATX sized cases will actually support micro ATX and mini ITX motherboards as well. However, if you do end up getting a giant ATX sized case, with a mini ITX size motherboard, your build is gonna look really silly when you have all of your components crushed into a corner and the rest of your case empty with nothing inside of it. After you get the right size, there are a lot of other features to consider before actually buying your case. For the most part, read the reviews and see what people are saying about the cases you're interested in so that you can see if it's a good fit for you. But the one thing I highly recommend you look for built into your case are SSD mounting brackets. Otherwise, you will have to buy one separately. Now, I hope I can safely assume you are a man or woman 
or non-binary of culture and are going to get Windows. There are a few sources where you can get a licensed key for cheap, like scdkey.com if you use my code. KY1, I don't get any money for it. It's literally just there to help you guys save money and eBay and other online markets. However, if you want, you can get an unactivated version from Microsoft's website for free. Disclaimer, this is not illegal, no matter how many dumb people in the comments try to convince you otherwise. It is not stealing or pirating Windows, which I do not support, by the way. Now, that should be enough explaining. I've got all these parts behind me. Let's get into the actual building process. Okay, so because this is a beginner's guide, not gonna go too crazy in depth on why we do certain things while we're building, but I just hope that you guys will trust what I'm saying has a reason behind it and you should pretty much do it almost all the time unless there is some absolute genius in the comment section who says otherwise. We're taking our motherboard out of the anti-static bag and we're gonna place it onto the box of the motherboard. The reason we put it on top of the box is because there are pins back here that we do not want to scratch or break. Plus, we don't have to worry about scratching up a table if we just put it here on the box. Static electricity is the number one killer of computer components. I mean, maybe not the number one killer, but it, it definitely can happen. If you are very nervous or scared about that happening to you, it is unlikely it does, but it can happen. You can get one of these. They're called anti-static wristbands. How they work, strap it onto your wrist, clamp this onto metal that would keep you grounded so that no static electricity can travel through your body. Unless you're dancing on carpet in socks, you really shouldn't be worried about static electricity. But if you want peace of mind, they cost like six bucks. I'm not using this. I just thought I would show it to you just in case you want to get one. We're getting our processor. Sorry that mine's a little dirty, it's used. I got an i5-6400 from Intel. This is a sixth generation processor and its socket type is 1151. This motherboard is a Z170 by I think gigabyte, yeah by gigabyte. Based off of those numbers, I personally know that this motherboard is an 1151 socket and supports sixth generation and up to seventh generation Intel processors. If you want to know just off the top of your head like I do, what I highly recommend you do is search what generation processor is compatible with what motherboards. Now, because this is a Z170, the Z indicates to me that this motherboard is overclockable. This processor is not overclockable. Some of you might think that's a waste of money, but like all my other parts, I got this used for a very good deal. So I'm using what I have available to me. Now, we're gonna take the clamp off of the CPU socket. We'll just lift this back. It's not sensitive at all, don't worry about it. Now we're gonna place our processor in the socket. How do we know which way it goes? It's a square. Well, if you look on the processor, there's always a little arrow that points where it should line up on the motherboard. There's another arrow. So, we're going to gently drop from like point blank range, our processor into that socket. It's not correctly lined up yet, there it is. Now, notice I didn't push it, I didn't tamper with it or mess with it because there are pins that connect the CPU to the socket. You never, ever, ever, ever force the processor into the socket. You should just be able to gently place it in there. If you feel like you have to force it or it's not sitting in all the way and laying flat seated, there's something wrong. One of the pins are bent. You're gonna have to do your best to straighten it out. But since that isn't the case for me, I get to now put the clamp on and firmly keep our processor in place. Next thing we're doing, these are the RAM slots. Because motherboards these days are fairly nice, this isn't just, you know, painted red and painted black to fit the color scheme. I mean, it, it, it does do that. But you'll see these are dual channel RAM slots. Now I could go on about that, but just know that because they're color coded, if you get dual, a dual set of RAM sticks, which you typically should, you will place the RAM sticks into the corresponding colors. Since I know I'm gonna be working with a fairly large air cooler, I'm gonna give myself a little bit of space and I'm gonna take the RAM sticks that I have here and I will line up the pins and gently place them in here. This CPU cooler is gonna be pretty large. So I'm gonna give myself that extra little bit of space if I need it. So you look at the brackets, there should always be a way to open them. This side does not pop open, so it's a one side open for the bracket. Most new 
motherboards work like that. And I'm gently placing it in the dim slot is what we call this and pushing it all the way in until I hear that click both sides. Now I know that my RAM is correctly placed inside the dim slot and push it in until I hear that on both sides. So now that I know my RAM is correctly placed inside the motherboard. Next thing we're moving on to is the case. Put this to the side. Now you might be wondering, why does this case have a see-through panel? Well, tempered glass and looking inside your build these days, it's kind of a trend. It's very popular. It looks nice, you know? I like my cases that way. If you want to get one that way, there should be a lot of cases like that for you to choose from. So looking inside this case, again, this is used. Yours will be brand new. They'll have the case wires wrapped up nicely for you. This case is a nicer one. It's by Corsair. I don't remember the specific model name off the top of my head. I know it's an expensive one. This one comes pre-installed with nice Corsair cases. Two in the front, one in the back. Now what we're looking to do is mount our motherboard inside this case so that we can continue building. But the first thing you want to do, because I always forget this step whenever I'm building by myself, that IO shield that came with your motherboard, this little thing, you're going to pop this in and you're going to place it in between the case and the motherboard. If you want a nice and easy way to do it would be to kind of place your motherboard in the case and try to pay attention to where these line up with the outputs of your motherboard. I can tell that mine are gonna go in this way. And I'm going to pop this in here through the side. Now I know you're not getting a good angle, but what I want you guys to know is that when you are putting this thing in, it's a little rectangular shape. It's got these little silver wedges on the outside that are meant for you to pop in to the case. And when you get it right, you should hear a little pop. I'm still push, see like that. See, I'm pushing, pushing. Oh, there we go. Now I can seat my motherboard. Now some cases will make you screw in these little raised bits before you can screw down your motherboard. So that's where I know I'll be able to put a screw through my motherboard to line up with these little screw bits. I've got six here. I could definitely put in another one. I'm a little bit lazy. I usually don't put in every single screw through to my motherboard. You probably should do that. And I'm showing you bad practice. So I'm making sure that my outputs on the motherboard line up with the IO shield, getting all the case cables out of the way first. Make sure that they're pushed through the side. And what I'm checking for here is to see if the outputs on the motherboard are going through the IO shield correctly and that the holes line up correctly so that I can screw through into the case. Most cases will come with a bag full of screws. Not most, all should. And what you're gonna look for is the screw that has, it's got a circular base with a hexagon screw head. And it works with a regular Phillips head screw or screwdriver. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put this screw in right where I see the hole lines up. We'll start in the corner, gently trying to get the screw in there. And it's threading. So now I'm just gonna screw that down until it doesn't go any further. Perfect, now I've got one down. Now what you wanna do when you're screwing these down is you want to go on diagonals if you can because what's gonna happen with motherboards, especially if you're working with smaller micro ATX motherboards, is that if I just started screwing all on one side, what's gonna happen is the plastic that holds this motherboard together is gonna to start curving upwards and it's gonna be very difficult to screw down the other side. So in order to avoid that, I'm gonna take this screw and screw it down diagonally on the other side so that I don't get one side completely popping up. Screw it down. We're gonna fit off this diagonal now. A small side note while I am putting in this last screw, you never want to force the screw in super, 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 super tight. Like you, you want to go until you can't really move it anymore, but there's always that little point where you can really force turning the screw more if you want, but I highly recommend against doing that. The reason I say that is because if you ever want to take the motherboard out, those little screw sets that are in between the case and the motherboard right now that I pointed out earlier, those can still be turned. If you screw this too tight and you start turning those at the bottom, you've basically permanently fixated this motherboard to this case. And something I highly recommend doing once you get into PC building is making it so that you can reassemble this because what you can do and what you should do is when you look to upgrade your computer, 
is you make it easy to sell your old one so that you can sub subsidize costs for the new one. So we've got the RAM in, the motherboard's down, mounted on the case, processor's in. We could do one of two things right now. We could put in the graphics card or we could put in the CPU cooler. Either one works. I personally am gonna go for the graphics card next. So I'm gonna get that out right now. So we have an MSI GTX 1050 Ti and you'll probably notice by now, but I am going for a black and red theme. It's not really anything that uh, you should be too concerned about your first time around, but if it's something you know you want to do, it does it does you know make the aesthetic of the computer look a little bit nicer. Now you'll notice here with this motherboard that this has three PCIe Express 16 slots. Now it's pretty intuitive with your graphics card having as many pins as it does to put it in one of these slots. Which one do you want to use? Well, as long as it says PCIe X16 any of them will work. If it says anything lower, like it does here, PCIe X8, you want to avoid that. It'll lower the speed of your gaming performance just a little bit. I'm not going to go too into detail with that. That's something you can look up in another video, but see, I can notice here it says PCIe X16, so I want to put it in here. I'm going to go ahead and take out these brackets on the side here of the computer. You can unscrew them by hand, but it's easier with a Phillips head screwdriver. So I make this mistake all the time. It's not really that big of a deal, but I misjudged where the graphics card would line up in terms of uh, these little brackets. So since I'm working with a nicer case, I can actually unscrew them and screw them back in. If you're working with a cheaper case, you will notice that sometimes with these little brackets, you actually have to break them off and can't unscrew them like I'm allowed to right now. If you have that and that's your situation, what you wanna do is make sure and, and line up by placing the graphics card somewhat near where you're gonna put it in that it matches up to the correct brackets that you're gonna break out. So you don't have to break out any of the brackets that you don't need to because you don't want like holes in your computer that you don't need to be there. All right, so I just made a mistake. I realized that the cooler we are using for our processor actually has a back part that needs to go on the back of the motherboard before I can mount the heatsink of the cooler on top of our processor. Fortunately, I haven't gone too far into this build, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to unscrew all six of the screws that we've used to mount down our motherboard into the case and try to gently slide that bracket into the back so that I can put the CPU cooler onto the processor when I get time. So this isn't the first time I've made this mistake, but this is a good teaching moment. I hope that you guys know when you're building a computer, you will have these little slip ups. It will be a little bit frustrating, but don't beat yourself up too much. It happens to everyone. This is probably like my 30th build and I've forgotten to do it now. So if you forget to do it on your first one, not a big deal. Okay, so I've got the piece now that goes on the back of the motherboard and while I shouldn't have rested it face down like that, I know from experience that computer parts are actually not as sensitive as we might believe them to be, which is why I let myself get away with some bad habits. That doesn't mean you should copy me. So now that I've gently placed them through those holes, I'm gonna flip it back over while holding it in place. And I'm going to keep these holes in place now by screwing them down with the parts that came for the CPU cooler. Now your CPU cooler might be a little bit different from the one that I am using, but for the most part, it should operate in generally the same way. There may or may not be a back piece that you have to clamp in there from the back before you screw it down, before you can mount your heat sink. Now I didn't mention this before, but with your graphics card, the same principle kind of applies with the RAM where you're gently pushing down until you hear that snap in. Once that happens, you can take those same screws or different screws, depends on your case, and screw the GPU bracket down in place because the fans on your graphics card are gonna be spinning pretty fast. And if you don't have this thing screwed down securely, your graphics card's gonna shake and you're gonna hear it in your computer when you turn it on. I've had that before. It gets very annoying very fast. So make sure this thing is in a secure position. So now the next step 
you, you would believe that you would want to put in the CPU cooler, the heat sink and the fan um, that go with it, but we're not doing that yet. The reason we're not doing that yet is because I'm gonna show you guys all of the different connections really quickly that still have to be made. So we have a case fan connection here. We have the CPU power here. We have the CPU cooler right there, the 24 pin motherboard power connector here, potentially another system fan here. We have the USB here, and we have some case connections for the panel right here. Now, like I noticed up here, if I put in this giant heat sink, and this isn't even all of it, this is the fan that still needs to be attached to the side. If I put this in right now, it would not be easy at all to reach back here and put those extra connections in. So what I'm gonna do to make this a little bit easier on myself is I'm gonna open up the back side of this case now and I'm gonna start installing our power supply so that I can correctly cable manage everything the way that I want it as best as I can before I put in our CPU cooler. So your case might be bigger. There might be more space for your hands up here if you, if you were to install your CPU cooler before plugging everything in. But I'm noticing here, that's not gonna be the case for me. So I'm gonna go ahead, install the power supply, make sure I have all my connections made to the motherboard the way that they need to be. So, power supply, let's unbox it. Now it should be pretty intuitive where this thing's gonna go. We're gonna take this, put it at the bottom of the case. Now, there's a big debate sometimes. Well, it's not too big of a debate. Most of the times people would say the fan should actually be facing downwards so that any dust gets blown out through the bottom of this ventilation system in the case. However, you have to take into consideration the airflow coming into your case and the airflow leaving your case. Now, if I look at the fans here, I can tell that because the blades, they're kind of showing this way instead of this way, I, I guess concave, convex, I don't know which one it is, but because the, the fan blades are bent like this, I know that air is gonna be sucked in and blowing this way into the computer. And if I look at the two front panels, because they're faced like this, pointing outward, I know that air will be blowing out through here. So the only air coming into the system is actually right here. So if I really wanted to, I could flip this fan face up like so, but I know how good Corsair fans can be. And I know that if I really feel like I'm lacking airflow, I can install some more fans up here. So what I'm gonna do is install the power supply with the fan facing downwards. Every case is pretty much the same. There are four very obvious screw holes that you need to line up for your power supply on the side. One, two, three, four. They're pretty much all directly in the corner. It is very obvious where these screws should go. So once you got your power supply lined up with the rectangular hole, screw the screws in. Okay, so we got our power supply screwed in. Now, I can take these cables throw them back into the back panel of the case and then pop them out where I need to plug them in. Now you might be wondering, well, why don't you just go and plug it in? Well, look, if I did that, now I got this giant ugly cable hanging over the top of my glass panel, which I'm gonna be seeing through. It doesn't look good. You know, you can do it. It really is up to you. But like me, once you start to really like and enjoy PC building, you don't really wanna settle for mediocre. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick out the cables that I'm gonna do first. So I'm actually gonna go up with this tougher one here. So I'm gonna get my, my four pin CPU connector and you'll notice that they write on here, CPU right there. So I'm gonna loop it back through this rubber protective grommet and then bring it back up here so we don't have a long cable sitting in our way. You need to take off the back panel, so follow along as I do this. Okay, so now I have my CPU cable up here, ready to be plugged in at the top of the motherboard. And this is basically the shapes game. If you played this when you were little, the correct shape goes in the correct hole. Not too hard to figure out, even if I don't do a very great job of explaining where certain power connectors go on the motherboard. If you really are struggling that much, just count how many pins there are. This is an eight pin hole. I've got a total of eight pins here, two four pin connectors. I'm gonna put them in here. Put them in until you hear that pop. Give them a light tug. If they don't come out, they should be in correctly. Now you move on to the next one. I'm gonna go ahead and do this 24 pin connector here.
All right, got the 24 pin connector ready to be put in. Now you'll notice most 24 pin connectors like this, they go 20 pin, four pin. It's a little weird. Sometimes it's hard to handle, but because we properly planned plugging our cables in before installing our CPU cooler, we have plenty of room to wiggle around and make sure that we plug everything in correctly. Another connection we need to make is for our graphics card. Now, not all graphics card require power. You can tell right here by looking at this six pin connector that this one needs power. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for a VGA cable right here. See that this one has six pins? That's what we'll be connecting into here. Okay, so this only needs one six pin connection for this graphics card, some need two. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in and you'll notice that now we kind of have this little ugly other six pin hanging off here. The reason this is here is like I said, some graphics cards need so much power that they need two six pin connectors. Now I don't like this just randomly hanging off like that. It looks kind of ugly. Could you cut it off? Yeah, I mean, you could, and this would work fine, but you know, then you'd have to worry about exposed wires. Now I'm gonna take one of these twisty ties that basically come with every computer package you'll ever buy and just gently lay this cord next to the other and tie it off. Looks a lot better already. Now that I've gotten all of our power supply connections to the motherboard, processor, and graphics card, all that's left is to make sure I have all of the case cables connected to the motherboard as well. We'll do this one. This one's pretty simple. This is for the USB ports at the front of your computer. And if you have a newer motherboard, which I really encourage you to get, it's really easy to line this up. Like I said, shapes game, but most of them just really big inside the port say USB 3.0. So go ahead and find one that's very comfortable for your cable and just pop it in there. Very simple. All right, so now we're gonna be doing what I think to be the hardest part um, in a computer build process, which are the panel connections. They're, they are the skinny, tiny, little connectors that come from your case, and there'll either be three or four of them, and they'll read off as HDD LED, power switch, power LED, and the, the optional one that is sometimes there, not always there, is the reset switch. Now, in newer, nice motherboards, they'll have a nice little like kind of rainbow color coding to show you where they should go. On older motherboards, they do not have that. And sometimes they don't even do what this motherboard says. We're really big on the board, it says panel. So it tells you where it should be. What these cables do, they give your power button a little ring light to let you know when it's been turned on or off. And it allows your power button to work in general in the first place. Each of these little cables has a positive cable and a negative cable. Most of the time, what has worked for me so that you don't always have to read the manual is making sure that the writing on that cable is facing outwards. They're never facing inwards towards each other. That's usually all it takes to make sure that you get the positive and negative cable oriented in the right direction. Because if they're not oriented in the right direction, if it's facing the wrong way, it's not gonna work. So I don't need to pull up the manual for this motherboard because like I said, this is a nice motherboard. It tells me right below the little rainbow pattern where the power LED, the power switch, the reset switch, the HDD LED, where all that goes. The part of this that is really the most painful part after identifying where it goes is gently making sure you get these pins to go in correctly. I cannot emphasize how often it's taken me to get, I'm gonna just go ahead and start trying to do this, how often I have failed numerous times trying to get these little pins in the right spot just because they're so skinny and so small. So out of everything that you'll do with your build process, I can almost guarantee you this one will be the most frustrating. Okay, so fortunately it didn't take me too long to get the panel pins in there. The last thing we gotta worry about is the HD audio pin. So this also comes from your case. For the most part, what I found with motherboards, at least the ones that are made more recently, it's always in the bottom left-hand corner of your motherboard. Nowadays, like I said, they make it a little bit easier for you to find these connections. It says audio, nice and big inside there. It's really hard to make that mistake. But uh, in order to make this cable management a little easier, I'm gonna run this cable down one more grommet just so I don't have it laying over the entire motherboard. Make sure I got the pins lined up correctly. So with your HD audio cable, 
there is randomly one pin missing, so it makes it a little bit easier to line up when you flip it over and pay attention, make sure the socket matches the actual pin. That wraps up everything except for some case fans. So you kind of just match these little four pin connectors into anything that says sys fan or case fan will be a good option for your four pin or three pin, sometimes three pin fan connectors. There are other four pin slots that are not meant for case fans. There are ones like your CPU fan and that's usually marked by, it, it's, I believe it's CPU opt. So it's CPU underscore OPT. That one you don't want to use a case fan for. That one goes for your CPU cooler. That fan speed will go up and down depending on the heat of your processor. So I'm just going to go ahead and lock it in. Another side note, these connections can be a little bit tricky. Um, they're similar to the panel pin connectors in that they're skinny little pins. So don't be too forceful. Be very careful when you put these things on. You don't want to ram them in there because if you bend a pin, you're going to have to unbend it. And once you start bending very thin metal, it makes it more likely to snap off. So just be very careful. Looking for my third and last case fan connector. So it looks like everything but our CPU cooler has been plugged in and installed, obviously other than our solid state drive. So what we're gonna do now, these extra pins or these extra connectors, we might still need these later in the future, we don't know, but we don't just want them hanging out laying on top. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all these connectors and we're gonna push them through these rubber grommets into the back of the case and if we do need something, we can connect it back there so that we're not showing any of these ugly cables. So I know that we will need these SATA connections that you can tell that they're SATA by the little L when you look inside the pins. I know we'll need these later, but I don't just want to lay these underneath the case and kind of crush them. You can do that. I've, I've definitely done that in the past and there's not really an issue, but just for the sake of uh, now, just so these kind of don't get crushed so that viewers like you get bad habits, I'm going to tie them up with another twisty tie and kind of throw it in a socket, well not a socket, in an opening in the case. And uh, we'll leave them there for the time being, but it's not going to stay like that permanently. Okay, here's the heat sink. I'm gonna go ahead and screw this thing into the mount that we screwed in earlier. This is the fan that will be connected to that heat sink. I just wanna make sure there are no spacing issues. Quick tip, these fans that come onto your CPU cooler, the heat sinks, they can actually typically either be installed on one side or the other side. I think for the most part, they always come pre-installed so the, sna the fan snaps on, like I just have it now. In order to get it off, you just kind of lift these little clamps. So because this heat sink will be in here and we're gonna have air coming in right here, blowing onto the heat sink, I'm actually gonna switch sides and have the fan placed on this side so we can get a better use of our airflow. Because if the air's blowing directly onto here, we don't need a fan kind of getting in the way of that. This metal is gonna get really hot because it's gonna be sucking that heat up from the processor. So what I hope what will happen is that air will blow into the heat sink, cool that down, and this fan will suck the air off of the heat sink and make it even more cool. That's the hope at least. Now that we've got it snapped on, we're gonna go ahead, line up the screws and get our CPU cooler in place. Oh, guess we can't get it in place because the fan is actually in the way now. So, screw the heatsink down first, then install the fan afterwards. Hi, this is Chris from the future, and I'm here to let you know that for whatever reason, the footage of me applying thermal paste onto the processor is corrupted for whatever reason. And as much as I would like to be able to demonstrate that for you, I'm just gonna let you know how it kind of went down. Basically, you take your little tube, you uncap the top, you put a little pea-sized drop on it. There are a million different ways people tell you all over YouTube on how to apply thermal paste. I go with a little pea drop. Other people say X, they say a little line, they say a little swivel, an S, whatever. I put a little pea drop in the middle because once you put the CPU cooler on top of it, it's gonna mush and spread out and the most important thing you wanna do is cover the very center of the processor, 
you want to cover the whole top ideally, but the main source of that heat is coming from the little silicon chip right in the middle of your processor. So enough from future Chris, let's go back to the video, but I just thought I'd let you know that I did apply thermal paste, so don't think I didn't. Same rules with screwing apply as last time. Screw it down, not so tight that you ruin the screw connector underneath, and always do a diagonal. You should always expect the fourth and final screw to be the most difficult. It's always the one that wants to go down the least. Okay, perfect. So it's on there, looks good. Now I notice that before I can put this fan on here, that the CPU opt port that we talked about earlier is actually gonna be blocked if I just go ahead and slide and clip the fan on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach that before, if it'll go in, yeah, I'm gonna attach that before I snap the, kit, or the fan onto the heat sink. Make sure that you always plan ahead when you can in PC building because it will pay off dividends and it will save you headaches, I promise. Looks like it's clipped on pretty safe. I'll try to tuck this wire away as best I can. And everything looks pretty good. We're, we've almost got a fully built computer. The only thing left, the drive, our solid state drive. Now, I'm sorry again if I am confusing you guys with the packaging of like, you know, my processor or my solid state drive. I always get my stuff, not always, but most of the time when I'm doing builds for you guys, I get my stuff secondhand. Saves me a ton of money. So let me go get some scissors. I'll cut this bad boy out and we can wrap up the build. So remember, like I talked about before, when it comes to looking at the features of your case, well, you'll notice that there are no brackets that you can see that fit this drive. Real quickly, we're gonna check the back. Oh, look at this. Lucky us. So this case actually does come with some solid state drive brackets. As you can see, they will fit our two and a half inch solid state drive. And what we're gonna do now is get the right screws. They, they should come with your case or solid state drive. I'm gonna have to go find some because like I said, all my stuff secondhand. And you will screw them into this little bracket. Let's see if I can get this out. Oh, you gotta unscrew them, Jeez, Not all cases have similar SSD mounting brackets. There we go. And let's see where do the screws need to go. You wanna make sure that your SSD is facing outwards so that you can connect your power and data cable. Oh, you might actually just be able to... The way this SSD bracket is built is so that you actually don't have to screw it down. It looks like you can if you really want to, but since this doesn't look like my drive's gonna be moving all that much, I'm shaking this and there's almost no wiggle room in here. I mean, there is no wiggle room in here. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and screw this thing back down onto the bracket. This thing was made really nicely, so I don't have to do this, but like I said before, if your case does not come with a solid state mounting bracket like this one does, you will have to buy your own. Okay, if this is our drive, if this is where our operating system is going, how do we connect that to the rest of our computer? Well, you need two things. You need to be able to power it and you need to be able to get data from it. So here it's called a SATA cable. This is the smaller one. The smaller one is for data. So we're gonna go ahead, connect this cable through here, and then before I line it up through the grommets, I'm gonna to check to see where the other SATA cable port is on the motherboard before I go and do that. But like we said before, we also need the power cable. So I'm gonna undo this twisty tie that I did earlier, holding these cables for me. So let's see, we have a few, but I'm gonna go ahead and use this one because I think it'll give me the best possible control later for when I actually wanna tie all these cables up in the back. So you plug, go it in all the way, I heard it pop, or not pop, but snap into place. Now be careful, these SATA cables, these L brackets are very easy to break. You break this thing, you're gonna have to get a new one. They're not easy to fix. They're just a pain in the ass once they break. So make sure you don't break it. I'm gonna look for where a SATA port is. They're right here. Sometimes they're stacked up on the side. You don't look down directly at them. They're coming in from an angle. I need to slide my SATA cable through. Now on this motherboard, there are six. You can typically plug them into any one. It really doesn't matter. So I'm gonna try and get this into port zero. Boom, got that into port zero. And technically right now, if we plug this computer in, everything should work. But before we do that, 
because I'm gonna teach you guys how to build a computer the nice looking way. You gotta manage all these cables. Now what I do most of the time is I take all these things and if I can hide them and they don't show, when I'm looking through them in the front panel, it's like they don't exist. But I'm gonna do a little bit of a better job here and I'm gonna try and tie these off with that one little twisty tie. So these cables line up here pretty decently. Under here, wrap these bad boys up, clip that off to the side, lay them over here. Now they're not so loose. This SATA cable and the CPU fan, uh, you know, they're not gonna flop around too much. This cable management for me, it's not perfect. I'm not gonna be plugging in any more drives to this build. So now I'm gonna take my back panel, which we removed earlier, put it back on. Slide it in. Perfect. Take those two screws. Flip this bad boy back over. So everything looks good. So now we put this panel right back in, slide it into place. Screw this down. And now it looks like all we have to do is install our operating system and this thing will be good to go. Before we take it over, I'm gonna do this quick explanation here, kinda of huddled into the camera. I have Windows 10 installed on this little thumb drive. This is the unactivated version I told you about. There are plenty of tutorials on YouTube that show you how to get an operating system, Windows 10, unactivated for free. The one specific tutorial that will be best is uh, actually made by Nerd on a Budget by Danny Lee. Uh, he goes over and shows you how to install one onto a USB thumb drive, so I'm not gonna show you how to do that. Go search that tutorial. Before we even turn the computer on, we're gonna plug this into one of the USB ports. I'm plugging it into the front panel. You could plug it into the back panel, whichever one you want, but it's plugged in. So as soon as we turn this thing on, you guys are looking at the screen, you'll know what and where Windows 10 is coming from. At this point, you should have the power cable that came with your power supply plugged into the computer, plugged into the wall, and at the very least, have your mouse and keyboard connected to the USB ports in your motherboard that you know came through the IO shield, and then have the USB stick that has Windows 10 on it plugged into another USB port coming out of your computer. A small side note before you, you know, press the power button on and you freak out and think that it's not working, make sure that that little power switch on your power supply has the little dash pushed in, because that means on. You, you can turn on and off the power supply on custom built computers, so make sure that's going on before you freak out. Hey, there we go, all right. So, okay, nay, 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 nay. Reboot and select proper boot device. Okay, it looks like I just have to press F12 the second the computer comes on. Delete or F12, either one. Delete, 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 delete. Perfect, okay. Okay, so we're going to the BIOS tab in the UEFI and boot option one right now is the SSD which it should be most of the time. But right now, since there's nothing on it, it won't boot anything. So we're gonna choose our boot option number one, and we're gonna select it to USB, USB disk, because that is what our operating system's on. And then boot option number two is now our SSD. So with that, we're gonna move up to save and exit. Hit save and exit setup. Double click that, save configure res and reset. Click yes. Now the computer's resetting. We should be booting off of the USB stick with Windows 10 on it now. Perfect, all right, here we are, Windows 10. Hit next, click install now. Okay, so here we go. Activate Windows. You're gonna go down to this blue text, click I don't have a product key. Now it's gonna ask you which Windows 10 you want to install. I always do Windows 10 Pro. Click next, click that you accept the license terms. Everything from here on out should be pretty straightforward. After you have a computer that has installed Windows successfully, it's gonna reset a few times. What you wanna do is after you've gone through this full installation, is you're gonna wanna pull out the USB stick while the computer is off 
in a reset after everything's installed. You want to make sure everything's installed. If you haven't got to the step that says finishing up and that's gone through 100%, you don't want to pull the USB stick out. Because what's going to happen is, is once Windows installed, if you still have the USB stick in there, it's going to keep trying to reinstall Windows over and over because right now we have the USB stick set to the number one boot priority. Once that USB stick is pulled out, the only other thing that the computer will be able to boot to is that SSD, which should have Windows 10 on it after everything has installed like I said it should. So that's pretty much the end of this video. Uh, I'm going to try to get a better camera angle for this outro. And that is the end of this video. It was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but uh, hopefully I can edit this down to a very digestible length for you guys. If you found anything confusing, please leave a question in the comments. If it is relatively simple to solve, I might tell you to search it and Google it on your own because for the most part, every aspect of computer building typically will have an entire answer in video format on YouTube because there are so many facets to computer building. It's very hard to crunch, crunch? condense it all down into one simple video. So I hope that you guys understood everything. I know that I kind of rushed through the Windows installation. If it was confusing at all, I, again, I know this is a little bit of a cop-out answer, but I highly recommend that you go search a tutorial on YouTube. Installing Windows 10, it's pretty easy. Even if you've never done it before in your entire life, there are only a few options and it takes common sense to just, you know, get the thing done. But, uh, I hope that you guys found this video somewhat entertaining or informative in any way, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you guys so much for watching. I know you guys have been asking for this video a lot, so if you can, help me out, share it, like it, comment, whatever. And as always, have a great day. <laughs>